America is facing a teen mental health crisis, and research points to social media as a key factor. Young people live in two worlds. Their digital lives are increasingly impacting their physical lives. In a five-episode special series, Catalyst for Change brings together experts, educators, and advocates to better understand the impact of social media on mental health. It also explores how to foster healthier interactions with technology and renew our relationships with nature. Subscribe to Catalyst for Change wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Say More from Boston Globe Opinion. I'm Shirley Leung. These days, there's nothing that politicians on both sides of the aisle agree on. Well, maybe there's one thing. My administration has taken the toughest ever action to confront China's trade abuses. We will not allow China to isolate Taiwan. I made it real clear to Xi Jinping that uh, we're going to compete fully with China. Here in the U.S., the rise of China is often seen as a threat, a threat to our economy, a threat to our democratic values, a threat to our status as the global superpower. And the U.S.-China relationship seems to grow more contentious each day, with spy balloons, hacking, and military exercises in the Pacific. It almost feels like we're sliding toward a Cold War with China, or maybe we're already in one. My guest today knows the China story inside and out. David Barboza spent 12 years in China as a foreign correspondent for The New York Times, focusing on business. He wrote hundreds of stories detailing daily life, the economy, and corruption at a time when China was undergoing an astonishing economic expansion and starting to really flex its muscles on the global stage. In 2015, as China's authoritarian turn was making life harder for journalists, David left China and then left The Times to start The Wire China, a digital news and data platform focused on the Chinese economy. In our conversation, David really pushed past the simple China as a threat to America narrative and got me thinking hard about what it means for two superpower nations to have a relationship in the modern world. I started by asking David about the strange backstory to a piece he wrote early on for The Times about a factory in China that made children's toys tainted with lead. Here's our conversation. There was a story about Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> uh, I know my boys were obsessed with this talking toy train, but things got complicated for you when you worked on that story. Can you tell me a little bit more about that story? Because I think it says a lot about reporting and working in China. <laughs> Yeah, so I think this was 2007. There were lots of stories that year about lead paint in toys. And at some point, this story about Thomas the Tank came out and I was sent, or we've tried to figure out, well, where is where is the factory to this that, that's producing these Thomas the Tanks? So we just decided we would go to the town, we would go to the factory location, we'd try to meet the general manager. And so we got to the gate and they let us in and I had a photographer with me. And so when we were on our way up to meet the general manager, we passed the assembly line for the Thomas the Tank. You know, they were rolling off the, the assembly line. And of course, he started photographing it and someone came up to us and said, what are you doing in here? And uh, we said, oh, we, we're just here to meet the general manager. They ended up saying that they were going to arrest us in the factory, that we were actually American spies or something, and we were stealing wow. their IP that we were we were not journalists, and we were like insisting, no, we're we're journalists. And so they held us in a in a room. Um, it was almost. Did you feel like, like a hostage? Yeah, we we well we were. <laughs> we I I can't remember if it was eight or nine hours that um, we actually tried to leave, and they they like chased us down and tried to almost tackle us, like they weren't going to let us out. And they insisted that we give back, you know, any photographs and um, that we confess that we're spies. And it turns out the photographer had hidden the the disc with his with his images in his sock. Um, wow. You know, so when they, yes. <laughs> and anyway, we eventually got out at something like 2 a.m. And 
and had to write some confession that, oh, we entered a building. Um, but then it turns out like the next morning that the Thomas the Tank photos were on the front page of the New York Times. And we had our story about the site of where these toys were coming from. So were you scared? You know, actually, I was not very scared. When I got into China, for the most part, there have been lots of stories of, you know, dissidents and bad things happening. But business journalists were welcomed for the most part in China. Believe it or not, I would show up at at factories and companies. And when I got there, there would be a big sign in neon saying, welcome New York Times to our factory. Sometimes I would get out of the car and a bus would show up with other cameramen from the like local TV station, like celebrity journalists is visiting our town. And they would interview me before I interviewed the people that I was there to visit. I recall the first year I was in Shanghai, I was invited by the local government to an event which welcomes all new journalists from around the world to some dinner. And I went there and I remember the government official got up at the podium and he started reading his speech and the speech was something like last year the city of Shanghai was mentioned in 62,322 articles. You know, it was like all numbers of how much more recognition the city is getting and therefore how much more of foreign investment is coming in. And it was all about welcoming foreign capital, foreign journalists, internationalizing the country it would be a many years later before it really got dangerous for me. The early years were for the most part, I'm not writing about politics, I'm writing about business. It was actually a great time to be a reporter, a business reporter in China. So let's talk about your penultimate story while you were at the Times. In 2013, you were awarded the Pulitzer Prize for exposing corruption at the highest levels of Chinese government. Notably, the billions in secret wealth amassed by the relatives of then Prime Minister Wen Jiaobao. So how did you get into that story? Yeah, so let me try to give you the short version, which is, I think from maybe the second year I was in China, you know, as a business reporter, I was meeting lots of people in the business community. And they would usually at a dinner or a lunch off the record would mention to me, you know, actually, do you know about the so-called princelings, the sons and daughters of high-ranking officials and their secret wealth? And I would say, what are you talking about? And they would say, you know, they have shares in these companies. And and I'd ask them, like, how do you know that? And they'd say, well, there there are no records and you can't find that, but it's, it's kind of an open secret that they're really wealthy. And I heard this every single year from wow. lots of people, from my friends. And then they got more specific. Like, do you know about this person's wealth? Do you know about that person? So for years, I'm trying to figure out, well, everyone is telling me this, but everyone tells me there are no records, you won't find it. But in 2010, my editor visited me in Shanghai and I felt, you know, I'm now six years in, this year or next year might be my final year. I'm already over the the three to five year period, which is generally what foreign correspondents for the time stay in China. So I started to think, I want to take on this very difficult story. And around that time, around 2010, 11, learned there actually in China are corporate documents and I could get access to them. And after a while, I discovered I could actually request the records of these private companies and go through them and find out who owns them. And then, of course, they wouldn't say the prime minister's son or daughter or cousin, but I would find shell companies or companies, layers of companies with kind of odd names that traced back to some relative of a senior leader. If you actually were crazy enough to spend a year going through them, you know, printing them out, pasting up maps and finally finding like this company is linked to this company, which is owning this company, you would eventually find a series of unusual transactions in major companies 
And then if you decided you were crazy enough to go to cemeteries and find, you know, whether these are really, who, who are these relatives of, we were able to trace it back to the family and friends of the prime minister. And so what I began, my hope at the beginning was, could I find a million, two million, three million in the hands of a relative of a senior leader? Instead, what we found was like a billion, two billion, three, I mean, I think we published 2.7 billion. We actually really found about 5 billion, but we wanted to go only with what we felt we could clearly document and go to court with. And so to me, the remarkable thing about working on that story and and putting it together is there were no sources. It was in black and white. Everything we found was actually documented. In your series, you painted a picture of if you wanted to start a company, um, you know, in China or you wanted to expand or to be successful, you needed some kind of government official, like relative or family friend to help you. What about today? I mean, do you think that kind of pay to play continues with government officials in China? I'm sure it does. It's harder for us to know now that we don't have journalists. You know, American journalists have largely been kicked out of China. But to me, it would be hard to believe that what I saw, which was so embedded in the system, could be eradicated in such a short time. I would rephrase it from what you said, which is when you don't have to have a government official supporting you to start business. There's lots of people that do private businesses. But as you scale your business, as your business gets larger, it becomes more important that you have government relations. And then at a certain stage, you might want to have someone very important supporting your company, defending your company. And what I was told by lots of my friends in business, but also I see in the documents is the bigger you get, the more you have to be connected in and the more you might be pressured to give shares to the relative, the mistress even, of a high-ranking official. The government, remember, controls all the land, all the licenses, you know, everything about the justice system, et cetera. You need the government on your side. So whether you're Apple or whether you're a small entrepreneur in China, the government is your, in many ways, your partner. That's the way it works in China. And you're not going to rip up that system because Xi Jinping says we're going to crack down on corruption, it's going to take a long time. So you've you've won, uh, actually you won two Pulitzers while you were in reporting in China. You have this plum assignment at the Times, working as a foreign correspondent. But then you left. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You left it all behind to start The Wire. Why and and how and and what exactly does your company do? (laughs) So I didn't leave so easily, right? It was 12 years, which at that time was the longest any New York Times reporter had ever stayed in China. So I was really there quite a while. I loved every moment of it. Maybe the last year was quite difficult as the government started to really threaten us and even send death threats. I was continuing to do investigations. They were just like, how do we get rid of this guy? And they didn't want to kick me out and they didn't kick me out but they wanted to make it uncomfortable for me, which is a very common tactic that they use is they find ways to threaten you. And so I would be stopped at airports, police would be sent to my home. After a while, it was pretty clear to us that this was a government orchestrated effort to get us out. But also, even if they didn't put that pressure, I probably was gonna leave that year anyway, because it was 12 years. And so, It was a good time to just get a refresher, get, think about the world differently from being inside of China, even though it was the best job I could ever imagine. So I came back to the Times and, you know, kind of suddenly didn't know what I would do. And I was proposing that we have all this incredible data that me and my co-founder of this company, Lin, had collected on Chinese corporates and that we should combine a financial newsletter about China with great data, kind of like a little like a Bloomberg business model. I thought to continue to write about China, even if it was from the US, and to build a data platform, which is as an investigative reporter, 
it's always been my dream to take all of my records and ingest them into some sort of data platform rather than, as you probably know, most journalists put them in a box, throw them away. The Times right. does not want your <laughs> records. There's right. no there's no <laughs> library or archive at the New York Times. So how could I use all of this stuff? So in Boston, actually, to start, we started building this company, The Wire, with the idea that we could do high quality journalism in the news magazine, a weekly news magazine about China to begin with. But we could also have this great investigative tool of our own data platform. And we could also open it to anyone else who wants to pay for it. The hope is that this becomes a global corporate or business intelligence platform where journalists or lawyers or universities or anyone can sort of understand how the world works. It's not about corruption. It's not about like we're finding bad things at companies. It's about how do you understand how the business world works? Who makes the goods that you use? Um, what are the risks involved, but also what are the opportunities? What does my rival do? So there is no database like that in the world today. So The Wire, you report on China exclusively right now, uh, but you don't travel there anymore. Why, why not? So one, they're not welcoming or giving visas to American journalists. You may know, I think in 2020, they kicked out most American journalists from China for exactly the kind of thing that journalists do, right? They investigate, they look into things. Um, so China's changed quite dramatically since I left, and it's now less welcoming to journalists. And so it's a very, and also they have a surveillance state. So the China I was in is just completely different. The fact that I could, I could, I was often followed, but I could often, you know, get in a, a car with tinted windows and lose my followers. And it was like a cat and mouse game. But now they can identify you not only by your face, but even if you're wearing a mask, they have gate recognition, you know, G-A-I-T. They can have the cameras and say, we know that's David. Hey, we know who that is and we can track you all around the country. It would be very difficult to do the type of reporting that I did then with that kind of surveillance system. So the idea of reporting from China today for us and for the magazine, that's just, you know, that's not going to happen. When we started the magazine, the idea was not to try to pretend we're in China or station people in China. The idea was we're going to build a magazine from outside of China and we're going to write about China's relationship with the outside world. Do you miss being in China? I do greatly. Um, I miss my friends. I miss the food. I loved the job and I loved every day is a new story rather than covering in the US, I could be covering a beat like the, you know, the technology beat or the airline beat. I'm covering a country. I'm covering business in one of the most dynamic places in the world. I can go to the factory floor and see people producing the things that Americans are using every day and what type of sweat and work goes into that and feel an appreciation for what China does and what the people do but also a sense of, you know, shock at how much we're consuming from these factories and what the conditions are sometimes in those factories. But I was shocked to find that they were making heparin, you know, a drug at a home factory that was really filthy. So I saw every type of story. More of my conversation with David Barboza after this short break. Hey there, this is Brian Bergstein. I'm the editor of the Ideas section in Boston Globe Opinion. I work with incredible writers every day to bring thought-provoking, inspiring ideas to life. Two questions we try to ask in the Globe's Ideas section are, what if and why not? And the answers our writers have to those questions often surprise and delight me. If you want a little more surprise and delight in your life, subscribe today to the Boston Globe 
where we're always asking big questions about the things that matter to people in New England and beyond. Subscribe to The Globe now at globe.com slash subscribe. That's globe.com slash subscribe. Hi, Sam Ransbotham here. In every episode of Me, Myself, and AI, my co-host Sherwin Kotabande and I talk to AI leaders from organizations like Walmart, the Lego Group, Expedia, and Amnesty International. Whether you're an executive, an AI practitioner, or a curious individual, Me, Myself, and AI delivers actionable insights for building value, plus gives the backstory on the people making the technology work. Me, Myself, and AI is a collaboration between MIT Sloan Management Review and Boston Consulting Group. The podcast is available on all major platforms. So I want to really dig into mounting tensions between U.S. and China. You referenced this earlier. The two nations have been locked in escalating trade war and in fighting for political power on the global stage. And it's all really alarming. Do you think we're already in a Cold War with China? Yes, I think at least for a couple of years, it's been an economic war. And I think it's not like we're going into one. It's been playing out. It's playing out every day. Right. The U.S. sanctions Chinese companies. China sanctions U.S. companies. I mean, a thousand, more than a thousand Chinese companies like Hike Vision, iFly Tech. Like there are all of these companies that cannot get, you know, equipment from the U.S. that are on the so-called U.S. entity list. There are lots of different sanctions on Chinese companies. China just banned Micron Technology, one of America's biggest technology companies. There is economic warfare that's been going on, that is playing out all the time, every day, the maneuvering. You can see it, you can feel it. I mean, think about all the things happening just in the semiconductor sector. Um, China and the US battling in third countries for you know, the rights to mine or access to critical minerals. So we are already in the midst of economic warfare and geopolitical warfare, whether you call it Cold War or whatever you want to call it, there is a lot going on in this realm. And it's troubling, disturbing, scary that so much of what I was reporting on in my early years, right, which is the integration of China into the global economy. Americans invest in China, China invests in America. All of that is coming undone. Many of the people that I met and interviewed in China have been arrested. Many of the people that I knew don't want to be interviewed anymore. They're afraid that China might read about that interview or that the Americans might read about the interview and see them as, you know, too Chinese or too American. So this is a pretty troubling, disturbing moment, but it definitely there is some warfare. Now, let's talk about real warfare. What about, you know, do you ever see a military conflict between China and the U.S.? It's unlikely you're going to see outright warfare because where do you go with two nuclear powers? Like, um, are they really going to bomb one another? I think the, the risk, the worry people have, and you don't have to know a lot about the military to know this, is that there could be some sort of accident, right, that in the Taiwan Strait with U.S. in that area with ships there, with flights there, that they're all buzzing one another and threatening one another. So I worry not about outright planned conflict. I worry about miscalculation and whipping up a fury in each country against the other. Just the idea that the U.S. is so worried about China that it becomes hysteria or that people of Asian descent are targeted as like, okay, this is, it's unwelcome to, you know, immigrants from Asia because they could be Chinese. As you know, the university, some of our best scientists, my wife is Chinese. So that would not be a good place for America to be in. So I'm hoping that these, these tensions ease and also that they think about the possibility of an accident. How do you calm U.S.-China relations? I mean, how do you ease them? I wish I knew, but I think one way you do 
is by not talking about it in such simplistic terms and trying to understand the complexity of the situation, the motivations. I think tone really matters. And not just in the discussions of politicians, but even in the newspapers and media outlets that if our tones are hysterical, if our social media is hysterical, I kind of think that infects the society. So I kind of want to play the middle ground. And I think for the magazine that, that we're doing, I really think about and worry about every week what we publish to try to say, can you write or publish something fair, intelligent, ethical, and not everything does not have to be gotcha and outrage and aha, we have discovered that someone is really bad. And even the other day I met with someone from China and they said, I met many of your targets. And I thought, I don't have targets. I'm not like, I don't go out there and shoot people. I write stories and find interesting stories and try to tell them. And sometimes they're investigations, but I wrote 600 stories from China. Many of them were in culture. They're not only investigations. And that full list of stories, I hope, you try to represent storytelling about a place and not a one-dimensional place. I know you probably don't have a crystal ball, but I'm going to ask you anyways. What's the future of of China-U.S. relations? Are you optimistic, pessimistic? I'm not optimistic in the next five years. I'm hopeful. I hope I'm wrong. But I don't see a lot of bright signs that could come through in the next five years. In fact, I I worry it it could get worse. I think the hope is that maybe each country finds leaders that either tire of attacking one another or find a way to bridge those differences. But I don't see that coming anytime soon. And I think even if there was a leader that wanted to do that from either party, there would be pressure from others not to do that. And this comes despite the fact that Joe Biden and Xi Jinping met many, many times. They had the deepest relationship of two leaders of countries before they rose to the top position. You know, they were, they took off their ties, they went to drink, they went to noodle shops and things. They traveled around China. Yeah, they, they, I, in fact. When he was vice president or, or when they in were the both Senate vice or? president. So when he was vice oh. president, it was like the buddy buddy relationship. Wow. And they were both preparing. That is hard to imagine that. So, wow. I can't uh, even believe that. Yeah. So they were, in fact, people kind of attacked Biden for it for a while. He was like to say, you're too close to Xi Jinping once he ran for president. So now that's supposedly great. They had an understanding. They had private moments. And now, like, you know, what kind of relationship is that? And would either be able to have a good relationship and not be seen by the hawks in their country as selling out? I don't I don't know. But at least there's that little possibility that maybe they did know each other and they could do something now, but there would be a lot of pressure. I am optimistic in the long run that the two peoples have a lot in common. They naturally really like one another. I think, you know, at least my experience in China was there's a great relationship between the Chinese people and the American people and that that could come back. And as you know, we have lots of Chinese Americans here. So that is... I'm one of them. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I'm almost one of them. <laughs> so I'm I'm kind of hopeful in the long run, but not in the short term. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, and you had mentioned earlier about anti-Chinese sentiment in the U.S. And my husband's Korean, so we have Chinese Korean kids. And I really worry about hate and and discrimination when they grow up, uh, you know, as they become adults. And so that's it's it's really troubling. So one last question. I mean, you've watched China grow more powerful, you know, over the past three decades. Do you think China is on track to replace the U.S. as the global economic superpower? Well, they are on track, maybe not to replace, but 
to rival the U.S. in in every way. And I know people say, well, the demographics going against them and they have a lot of debt and they're now state owned. And there, there are a lot of problems in China. And I would often say, even when I was there, when they were growing by 10 percent, you would not want to trade places and have their environmental problems and the problems of population size. And like, I would not want China's problems, but they're incredible people. Some of the most dynamic entrepreneurs in the world are from China. Some of the best scientists in the world are from China. So to me, artists, I mean, in every way, the Chinese people are an amazing people, you know, and people believe this is like not a government that's very suitable to innovation and other things, but they have done amazingly well. And so are they are already are a leader in electric vehicles, in 5G technology, in all on the frontiers of science. They're sending satellites up, they're sending missions to the moon and Mars. They are doing incredible things and they're a great competitor to the US. They will do amazing things and they will help shape the global economy. So we have to accept that and figure out how do we get along with a country. Well, David, thank you so much. I hope we uh, chat again soon. Thank you. Great to be here. Say More is a production of the Boston Globe. Today's episode was produced by Daniel Ackerman and Alexis Sargent with help from Scott Hellman and Abby Kanina. Our editor is Jim Dow. Our engineer is Ariana Martinez. Our music is from APM Music. If you like the show, please leave a review and follow us on Apple Podcasts. Find us online at globe.com slash opinion. I'm Shirley Leung. Thanks for listening.